Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, August 11th, 2022. It is great to be back with Professor Adam Weirman. Adam, once again, it's great to be with you. Thanks for joining me. No, my pleasure. Adam, in our first conversation, we took a great tour of your approach to the research and the big societal questions that are impacted by it. Today, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's start first with your parents. Tell me a little bit about them and where they're from. Okay. Um, so my, my parents, I grew up in Baltimore, uh, just north of Baltimore. Uh, and my uh, parents are, uh, you know, from Seattle, Washington originally, and uh, moved out to Baltimore for basically soon after I was born when I was two. Um, my dad is a professor at uh, Johns Hopkins University there. Uh, so I was an academic kid uh, and my mom works in environmental monitoring and so I, I sort of joke sometimes that I'm despite my best efforts a uh, you know convex combination of their interests uh, <laughs> working in sort of mathematical tools for and you know sustainability is is really right in between what they did uh, despite you know trying to do very different things initially when I started college. <laughs> Are your parents Seattle natives or did they meet in Seattle? Uh, Seattle natives, yeah, yeah, Seattle natives. Yeah. What's your father's field? What did he teach? So my dad is, teaches applied math, uh, an area called uh, percolation, uh, which is you know random processes over graphs. Uh, and so, uh, you know, every once in a while uh, we run into the same crew of people uh, at conferences. Although we we are in different worlds for ninety nine percent of the time academically. Um, Did your father involve you in his professional world at all? Did you grow up knowing what it meant to be a professor? Sort of. So, you know, there was a lot of, for me, being a professor meant traveling a lot. So it was a lot of, you know, I would go along with them and we would add our family vacations on after a conference or something like that. And so I would be, you know, with my mom, uh, you know, doing some touring uh, after the conference or during the conference and we'd go uh, together as a family afterwards. So for me, that's what it meant. It was a lot of touring. And, you know, I would over the summer be down at Johns Hopkins, uh, you know, just playing on the quad uh, while he was at work if I needed to be. So I was around the university life, but he didn't really, you know, talk math with me. Uh, we were not, uh, you know, we, he didn't bring his work home in that way. And so we, we talked sports much more than math. Now, did your mom maintain a professional affiliation when you were growing up? Yeah, so my mom uh, was uh, worked in the air management, so air quality management. She worked for the state of Maryland for a long time, and then for the Mid-Atlantic region, she was the director of uh, their uh, air management association, uh, sort of the training and regulation coordination across states on the East Coast. Adam, were you always into computers, even when you were a little kid? Yeah, well, I mean, there weren't computers too much when I was a little kid, but yeah, we we were very, because my dad was a professor, we were very early to have computers at home, and, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, on them messing around in various ways uh, growing up. Um, what was the earliest computer model that you remember in the household? <laughs> oh, I don't know. There were, the, the desktop model, I don't remember, but I remember having a laptop very early on that was one of these, you know... Uh, you know, chest size devices that could sit on your lap, but was pretty heavy uh, and, you know, was not nothing like the form factor that we had today, but was a portable computer. And that was pretty exciting at the time to be able to carry it around and plug it in. Did you get a sense from your dad that computers could do things mathematically and scientifically that pen and paper might yeah. not be able to do? Yeah, that's yeah, definitely. So my dad in his work in percolation, one of the one of the problems that he was interested in was around understanding what's called critical thresholds of uh, gra lattices. And so you take a lattice, so a graph that has repeated uh, patterns in it. So like a triangles all mesh together, for example, and you let some process spread across it and you ask when what the how what the probability of spreading has to be for the you know process to take over the graph or to die out. Uh, you know, sort of that critical probability. And it's some of his work was uh, around kind of isolating those uh, thresholds perfectly. And, and that was often a very computational task of, you know, can you get the first digit? And now computers have gotten better and your algorithms got better. And you can nail it down to two or three digits with these, uh, you know, with the code that you, you, you could write there. And so he was he was definitely using a computational approach to, math, approach to mathematics. And while I didn't understand it, you know, that definitely came across that he was somehow using the computer for math. This intellectual heritage from both of your parents, your mom's environmental focus, even yeah. at an elemental stage when you were growing up, did you think that 
computers and systems and networks and things like that might be relevant for environmental mitigation issues? No, not at all. <laughs> uh, for growing up, there was no there was no connection in my mind between what the two of them were doing, uh, and you know it was it was I say uh, you know I was not so passionate about uh, either the math or the uh, you know environmental piece until I went off to college. Uh, sort of you know I was living in their household. Those were not the things that I was you know jumping at <laughs> often. I was good at math and I was good at the science, but it was not the you know the thing that I was really passionate about at that point. Now, did you go to public schools growing up? Yeah, so I was I was public schools all the way through uh, elementary, high, middle school, high school, um, and yeah, it was it was great. I I really like that. That's that's uh, a big part of what I believe for our kids too is that public education is really important for society as a whole, and that it's really important that we don't isolate kids from well-to-do families from the you know other kids from more economically diverse families and uh so you know we do that with our own kids as well now were you always more on the math and science track in school yeah so i was definitely good at uh the math and science stuff but i i i don't know whether it was boredom or whether it was just uh you know things outside of school were more fun. I was much more of the type of kid in middle school and high school to get the work done and then go outside and play basketball or soccer or uh, whatever it was, as opposed to really kind of uh, get absorbed in the schoolwork uh, and in the way that I became absorbed in it when I went to college. Adam, when it was time to think about college, was Hopkins sort of on your radar or was off limits? You didn't want to go. No, wanted some distance. Uh, and so, yeah, so college, I, you know, the typical schools, uh, you know, the MIT, uh, et cetera, are the ones that I applied to. And I think, you know, one of the challenges uh, for me as a high school student was after I toured MIT, I didn't enjoy it. And uh, I uh, was very much more excited about going to Carnegie Mellon because of the culture and the student life there. And uh, my parents couldn't understand why I didn't want to go to MIT. And so, <laughs> so there was a lot of discussion before I convinced them that a Ca- Carnegie Mellon was a, was a good choice as well. And by the time I was there a year or two, they were very, very uh, big Carnegie Mellon supporters. Now, was there a Northeast application rule for you? Would you have thought to apply to places like Stanford or Caltech? No, I was definitely biased towards East Coast, uh, so I uh, I don't think I applied to anywhere on the West Coast. Uh, uh, and was it computer science from the beginning? Were you thinking about colleges no. within the not within specifically a computer science framework? No, I, I was very uh, my my college time was very exploratory. So I started off thinking that I wanted to do civil engineering. Uh, because I wanted to be an architect, but wasn't a good enough artist. And so I thought uh, (laughs) civil engineering was a good way in. Uh, And, you know, then I had a good time in civil engineering, but also felt that it was not quite what I expected. And uh, by the time, you know, during college, I went through civil engineering, psychology, statistics, math, and then finally declared a CS major my senior year and ended up graduating with some sort of majors majors or minors or specialization in all of those areas uh, when I was finally done with undergrad. So it was a, it was a long winding path uh, that gradually got me to CS. Adam, just the timing, when, when did the internet come along that might have really influenced the way you thought about computers and what they could do? So in middle school, Cool. I think already I was using the internet, but in the sort of listserv, email, uh, text-based format, uh, you know, playing around with it and, you know, investigating things. And that was fun. And I wrote a little bit of code even at that point to, you know, try things out. Uh, and then definitely in, you know, high school, I was doing, you know, writing things for my fantasy baseball team and writing code to search, uh, you know, baseball player stats and make my organizations for doing that sort of thing. Um, uh, As an undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon, what were some of the big ideas in computer science that you remember? So the, the course that got me to really realize that computer science was what I wanted was a course taught by uh, Stephen Rudich who was uh, a really special teacher at at Carnegie Mellon. Um, So he taught a class called uh, Great Ideas in CS. And it was, uh, in some sense, meant to be an introductory discrete math course, uh, kind of like Math 6 at at Caltech. Um, But 
he taught it in a way that each lecture was basically a performance of, uh, you know, a vignette on its own, a story. And, you know, he would, he, it's funny, he, he would start every class with a magic trick 10 minutes before class in the room, like a full on like magician style magic trick that was amazing. And so uh, people, anybody from any other class would come watch the magic trick, the classroom would be packed. Uh, and then everybody would run off to their classes if they weren't in his class. Uh, and then, you know, it meant that everybody was there on time and everybody was super excited. And then he would start with a flourish after that um and each lecture was really designed to through a very fun problem solving exercise introduce some important part of discrete math whether it be induction or uh recursion or you know re uh, generating functions or something like this but it was always done through a really creative game or interactive in, uh, thing that you played and the homeworks in that class were notoriously difficult but they were you know, challenging and forced you to be creative with math in a computational way. And, you know, I just loved it and basically, you know, talked to him through the class and realized that that's what uh, CS was. It wasn't just programming, it was thinking in that way. And, you know, so then I was on board, uh, you know, at that point, I worked hard to be able to transfer into CS. This was your first entree into the creativity in computer yeah. science. Yeah, so before that, computer science to me was programming, which was fun, but it was a tool. And, you know, I didn't see that as something that I wanted to sort of spend my life doing. But, you know, this showed me that it's more than just kind of programming simple games and things like that, which is often what you do in your intro programming classes, or at that point, what intro programming meant. So the creativity aspect, would that be sort of the intellectual kernel of you starting to think about applying computers to societal benefit. Yeah, so starting to think of it as, you know, maybe a little bit that more, but more just the intellectual puzzle involved in figuring out how best to do something, figuring out what you can and can't do with computers, the, the algorithms and complexity side of CS. Uh, you know, once once that once I got drawn in by that, then it was well, you know, can I figure out algorithms that are useful that can make society better? But uh, the first nugget was just the uh, intellectual challenge of understanding uh, what's possible with algorithms, what's not possible with algorithms, how efficient can they be? Um, Adam, there's generally a, a, a cultural encouragement to go elsewhere for your graduate work. I wonder yeah. if you were a relatively latecomer to CS as an undergraduate, if that influenced your decision to stay. That was a big reason why I felt comfortable staying. So I had, I felt like I had just uh, gotten my foot wet at Carnegie Mellon and it was this amazing place. And there were all these people that I was just starting to get to know that I wanted to, you know, have a chance to work with and explore. And so it was, it was hard to walk away from that uh, to go somewhere else when I felt like I hadn't taken advantage of the amazing place where I was. Uh, and the master's, was it a terminal master's and then you went on to the PhD or that was incidental on the way? That was incidental along the way at Carnegie Mellon. So it was, I went straight into the PhD program and uh, then, you know, a lot, the stepping stone was the master's along the way. Tell me about your advisor, Morhar Holbalter, how you got involved with what she was doing at the time. So Moore is a really energetic, enthusiastic uh, person. She's uh, she's really a great mentor. So she at Carnegie Mellon, there's this process which is really nice uh, and intense, where you start when you start the PhD program, where you have I think it's two weeks, maybe three, no, maybe three weeks, where the faculty all presents you know 15 minute research pitches. The first year PhD students watch them. They have meetings in the afternoon. That all happens in the morning. In the meeting in the afternoon, you meet with faculty. And then at the end, you submit a list of who you want to work with. Uh, and so this is like a two-way matching process for advisors rather than coming in already matched to an advisor, which is what a lot of schools do. Uh, that was also another reason why I liked the idea of going to Carnegie Mellon, because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do yet, because I was so new to CS. And so this matching process let me push put that off. Uh, but so more her talk was very much like, you know, Stephen Rouge's model of 
extremely interactive and just giving us puzzles. She, so she basically just challenged us like, here are interesting puzzles in my research area. If you solve one, come and talk to me about it. Or if you're interested in solving one, come and talk to me about it and we'll work together on it and we'll see. And that'll be the way that we introduce. And so she, she uh, you know, got me uh, sucked into a couple of different uh, puzzles that were really interesting. And two of them actually led to research papers, you know, in my first year with her. Um, and, you know, we, yeah, so that was just, uh, she, she was really good at getting you motivated to work. And then she's also, one thing I really like about her group is she cares about fully developing her students. Uh, and this is something that I guess knew was important, partly because my dad was an academic and, you know, it's not just who's working in the area you're working in, it's will they help you become a better writer, a better presenter, a better speaker, uh, you know, all of these other things. And she really works with her students intensely on all of those aspects, not just giving advice on what problems you should work on. Tell me about those initial puzzles that became papers in your first year. Yeah, so so they were puzzles. Uh, it, a, lot, a big part of my thesis actually was in some sense motivated by one of them, which is uh, a very simple scheduling problem. Uh, which is there's if you have a single server and jobs arriving over time to that server, you uh, if you want to schedule the jobs to minimize their response time, their average response time, which is how long on average they have to wait before they finish service, how should you order them? What order should you do them in? Uh, and there's a very long standing result, which is that if you want to minimize the average response time, you don't actually need to know anything about the distribution of sizes of the jobs or the arrival process or anything like that. No matter what all of those are, you should schedule them in the order of shortest remaining processing time. So whichever job has the least left to do, you do that one first. And if a new job arrives, if it's bigger than the one you're working on, you just let it sit in the queue. If it's smaller, you switch to it right away and start working on it. Uh, so this is, you know, a provable, you know, really beautiful proof shows that that's uh, optimal. And so that was one of the things she asked, like, this is optimal. Can you prove it for me? Uh, and how do you and define optimal in this context? Is it just efficiency? The smallest possible average meet response time. The smallest possible. So you took the time from when each job arrives until it finishes service. Uh, that's its response time. You average that over every job that's going to come. Uh, that's the mean response time. If you want to make that the smallest, you always do things in shortest job first order or shortest response time first order. But, you know, the question at the time was people often didn't use this policy in practice, despite it being much better in terms of mean response time, because they were worried about fairness. They were worried about, you know, the large jobs are often important. Uh, they might get starved of service and never get finished. And in that case, uh, you're in really bad shape. Uh, and so the, you know, the big picture question was, is that really true? Uh, you know, is it really true that this is unfair to large jobs? Uh, but of course, to answer that question, you have to define what fairness means. You have to, you know, then prove results to ask about that. And uh, the first few years of my work was really understanding, you know, fairness and putting, uh, you know, axiomatic definitions for how you can quantify what fairness means in job scheduling processes and proving that, in fact, uh, unless you're in an overload situation, SRPT is fair to the largest jobs. Uh, and that, uh, you know, it really had, you know, it really works very well, you know, and, and these concerns people had were pretty, you know, fairly unfounded and that you could make little changes to it to even improve the fairness uh, further. But it, it was, you know, just as fair as the standard definition of a fair policy that people were using instead of it. Uh, even out of the gates without using it. And so that was one of my first big results to show that. And then as a result of that, the lots of companies and data centers and such were willing to start using size-based policies in their uh, systems. Uh, and so then a lot of my work in my PhD thesis was proving results about size-based policies, how to make them more practical, how to improve their efficiency, how to use prioritization in a smart way where you're still able to guarantee different service requirements or uh, different data loca locality requirements, things like this that come up in real systems that aren't in that simple model. So in a CS concept co context, is, is the notion of fairness zero sum? Is it by definition fair to one entity and unfair to another and you have to make those decisions so we no uh there's lots of different notions that you might concern yourself with 
So in, in this particular context of job scheduling, uh, there were actually, you know, four or five different definitions of fairness that came out that we were able to prove relationships between and understand which ones were consistent and which ones were inconsistent and, and these sorts of things. And some of them were very axiomatic um, uh, based on, you know, making sure that in any length of time you're getting one over nth of the service if there are n jobs in the system. Uh, some of them were sort of Pareto optimal notions. Like if I look at jobs of size X, uh, the minimum, uh, or sorry, the, the, the min max of the response time over at all jobs X should be, you know, a particular level. And if you're achieving that, then you're fair because that's the best min max that any policy can have. And that's the notion in which SRPT is as fair as anything. So SRPT has the same min max over job sizes of performance as any policy ever could. Um, and, and it's also strictly better in a Pareto optimal sense for every job size than the pure fair policy of always dividing the server evenly among every job that's present, which is often a notion of fairness people use, right? So if, we, if we're always dividing things evenly uh, among everybody, that gives a certain level of performance for every job size class. Uh, and SRPT is better for every job size class than that policy. There's no job size class that is worse than that. And that was a very surprising result when we proved that for people. And Adam, just to clarify, this is not a purely theoretical pursuit. This is industry relevant. People yeah. want this kind of research in their businesses. That's right. And so this was, this was uh, I think, another piece of what attracted me about Moore's research agenda was that she had that kind of theory for practice mindset where uh, the philosophy that I have now and that, you know, she taught me to a large extent was that you, you know, there's lots of ways to do theoretical work and algorithmic work. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is, is very deep and important and may find application in five, 10 years. Um, but there's sort of a different kind of theoretical work, which is the type that will have, uh, if it's successful, will have application in a year or two to real systems. And that's where I tend to like to live. And so this was work where, you know, there was a bottleneck. There are these way more efficient scheduling policies that people are scared to use because they don't want to be unfair to jobs. Uh, is that a real thing? If it's not, then they can immediately start to deploy these types of policies and improve their response times by a factor of two or three, uh, which is a huge win uh, when you're talking about latency and, you know, video streaming or latency in cloud email type jobs, things like this. Now, was Moore's approach where she had an eye toward industry and applications, was that representative of the culture of CS at Carnegie Mellon generally, or was she more unique in that regard? Um, she's pretty unique in that regard. So, I mean, Carnegie Mellon is a huge CS program there. They're, compared to Caltech, their, CS, their school of CS that's as big as Caltech is as a whole. Uh, and so you, there's a wide variety of cultures in CS. Sure. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so there's people like her and there's also people on every extreme. There's people that have every, in every corner of CS at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so even uh, from these first papers that gave you a pretty good taste of how yeah. this would actually translate to real world relevance. That's right. And it was really exciting because in her group, there were some students that were very practical. And so when I would prove these results, I could then work with them and we would deploy a system. And then that system would be a good demo that we could show to companies. Uh, and, you know, so I could spend a lot of time on the proof side, but also very quickly see a deployment by working with other students in the group. From these first few papers, did you have direct interface with, with industry, with potential clients? Did you see where this was headed? Um, a little bit. That was when I, as a first or second year student, I wasn't directly hands on with the companies as much, but, you know, I had a few conversations. It was more the senior students and more that were working uh, with the industry uh, partners. But then later on, there was definitely a like, you know, go and visit the industry labs and talk to them about what you're doing and uh, try to get them excited about trying out some of the algorithms that you develop. So to go back to that original offer for more that was so compelling to you, here are a few puzzles. Let me know yeah. how you do with them. How did those initial puzzles relate to some of the bigger research questions she was pursuing at that point? Yeah, so one of the big one of the puzzles was just to 
prove SRPT was optimal. And it's a beautiful proof. So as soon as you see it, you just want to work more with this policy. And so then I sh showed up at her door with the proof and showed it to her. And she's like, yeah, that's right. Now, what about fairness? Uh, would you actually want to use this? How are the long jobs created? And, and that led to a research problem. Uh, and so that, that was, uh, you know, day one. And by the end, I guess about six months later, we published our first paper, which was showing that uh, the first result was just that the asymptotically largest jobs were treated fairly. And then uh, a few months after that, we were able to prove that all jobs were treated fairly. I know that asymptotic has relevance in particle physics, of course. What does it mean <laughs> in CS? Yeah. So in, in, it means lots of different things. In this case, it meant the like if you let the job size go off to infinity, the infinite size job was treated fairly. And intuitively, that should that was an indication that all jobs should be treated fairly because uh, you know, the largest one should be the most likely to be jumped in front of by small jobs. Uh, it turned out, out that that wasn't actually true. It turned out that there was monotonicity in the fairness of uh, jobs where you had this interesting hump and then it came back down uh, once you got into the asymptotic regime. But our motivation for looking at it was that we thought that that might be the worst case in terms of unfairness. Uh, and so we figured out how to do that. It was an interesting kind of coupling arguments uh, from applied probability. And and then after we did that, we started to work on the rest and we uncovered this other kind of very unintuitive at the time phenomenon that the medium sized jobs were actually the most unfairly treated uh, by SRPT because uh, the large jobs stayed around long enough that they were there when the system was empty other than them. And so they got lots of service then, whereas the medium jobs could get jumped in front of and not have that empty period to catch up afterwards, potentially. Adam, you alluded to it a little bit. Tell me the intellectual process from those initial research puzzles into what ultimately was your, your thesis work. Yeah, and so it, it was. There was a a couple different threads, but that got me into scheduling and SRPT, and then the thesis work was looking uh, much more broadly at scheduling uh, than just one particular policy. It was trying to understand broad classes of policies uh, and understand kind of the practical things that often are missed, the impact of practical things that are often missed by theory. And so uh, scheduling and, and queuing theory were these big areas dominated in the like 70s, 80s, into the 90s. Um, and they tended to make very uh, simplifying assumptions about the systems that they were studying. Uh, and especially, you know, nowadays there's, you know, multiple servers, there's data locality, there's delays, there's startup and setup times as the servers move in and out of power saving modes. Uh, there's uncertainty about job sizes so that you don't know exactly how long a job is. There's failures that happen with servers that you need to be robust to. Uh, and so the simplistic scheduling policies and simplistic models didn't really capture the real systems. And so in some sense, the goal was, how do you modernize the theory in a way that you can uh, make it applicable to the systems that were out there in the world today and solve the problems that are leading to, you know, that the industry practitioners are facing. Adam, I'm intrigued by the idea that there are overly simplistic theories. What does that tell us about some of the biases of the theorists? Yeah. So, I mean, the they were simplistic theory in the sense of the models making simplifying assumptions, not in the sense of the technical work being simple. So right. the technical work was, you know, the reason why the models were simple is because the work was very technical and challenging and it had to be done in the simple models before you could even hope to go to the more complex policies and the more complex settings. Uh, but, you know, there, there have been a lot of developments in, you know, the technical side, especially around one of my you know, favorite topics, heavy tailed distributions, uh, which meant that you could apply the work in settings that it hadn't been able to be applied before. Um, and heavy tail distributions are another thing I should bring up as a, uh, uh, entry point for me and more that was, uh, you know, very appealing and has shaped a lot of what I've done where, uh, I had seen a little bit about heavy tails in my undergrad, but not a ton. And in one of her policy, one of her sort of probing questions was, uh, around what you expected the distribution of job sizes to be and, uh, why, and what properties that meant for scheduling. Like, what did that imply for what you wanted to do in terms of scheduling? Uh, and, you know, to kind of walk you through one of, one of those that I think is particularly clever, it's, 
you know, real, so real world jobs are in are heavy tailed. So they tend to be Pareto like or power law like, uh, which is very different than the sort of Gaussian world that most of the time you're taught in, uh, you know, undergrad probability courses. And that makes actually a huge difference for how you design systems and how you design scheduling policies. Because, you know, if you're, for example, in the job scheduling side, if you're scheduling jobs that are all kind of Gaussian distributed, then they're all kind of very close to the same size. Uh, and that means that just doing things in first come first serve order works pretty well. Uh, whereas if you have heavy tailed distributions, you have some really big jobs and lots of really small ones. If you do things in first come first serve order, then you might have, you know, 10 small jobs get stuck behind a really big job. And now all of them have a massive uh, delay because of that big job. Whereas if you had just done the big job last, the 10 small jobs would have really tiny response times and be out the system. And the one other job would have a large response time, but you'd be much better overall for the system performance and have much less work in the system at any given points and much less storage that you need and all of those things, everything would be a lot better. And so how you schedule, uh, you know, when you have heavy tailed jobs is very important, much more so than when you have light tailed jobs. And you can take advantage of the fact that you know there's going to be some really large jobs and lots of really small jobs to do things in your scheduling policy and your system design uh, that are very different and very interesting and simple and effective. Uh, Adam, as you mentioned, early in the graduate program, you didn't have much interface with industry, but that happened a few years later. What were the kinds of businesses that were showing interest in what you were doing? So scheduling in the cloud is the main one that I was working on at the time. Uh, so, so this is, you know, your, your data centers deciding how they do load balancing, how they do, uh, you know, the job scheduling and you're on the, in the web server side, for example. So uh, we, we, in our group, we released a couple of systems around web servers and video streaming and uh, database management that all kind of showed that size-based scheduling could be effective there. And so those were our entry point to talking with the companies. Did you ever work on site? Were you ever sort of in the mix to see what was happening, how these things were being applied? No, I never, I, as a grad student, I didn't somehow want to do that. Uh, as a grad student, I, I would visit, I would talk to them about the ideas and they I would be very happy if they implemented them rather than me going there to do the implementation. I wanted to be proving my theorems in, in, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and so, so I did a lot of uh, that. So it was a, a visit to talk to them about the ideas and to present why it works and to show our demo uh, and then let them take over from there. Uh, Adam, what was more style like as a graduate advisor? In other words, from the initial contact of essentially handing you a puzzle, did that dynamic remain through the dissertation or at some point you were coming up with your own puzzles? Oh, very much coming up with the own puzzle. So, so she had the, I guess, the model of, you know, early on, she presents problems and, uh, you know, you see which ones you're interested in. But by the time you were in year two or three, you were coming up with questions and working as a peer with her. Um, and, you know, it was a, it was a, she's a very hands-on, she works with you on the whiteboard. You have long, uh, weekly meetings where you're doing technical work together, uh, and writing the paper together and, you know, writing the code together kind of thing. So she, she's very involved with her students, which is really nice. Clearly you had a lot going on with your thesis research, a lot of different topics. Would you say the thesis was more of the many papers stapled together variety, or was there a single overarching theme that everything gathered around? It was a single overarching theme. I actually put a lot of work make it, for the personal side. I had time to write a really uh, involved thesis. So I put a lot of work into writing a thesis that was very much book-like in terms of providing an overview of how to think about scheduling uh, you know, the, the general thing was how to think about doing analysis of scheduling policy where you're analyzing axiomatic classes of scheduling policies instead of specific policies. And the motivation for that was that if you're divide, if you're analyzing every policy that prioritizes cert jobs, then it doesn't matter if that policy has lots of complexities that make it very complex because of the system implementation or not, it still follows that axiom 
And so the analysis holds and the guarantees hold and the balance hold and everything that you've proven still holds, even if there's a lot of miscellaneous things that need to be done just in a hacky way to make it work in the system, still the theory applies. And so uh, for the thesis, I, I kind of overviewed a lot of the standard techniques and then showed how modern techniques let you get results that are parallel, but for broad classes of policies uh, instead of for a specific policy. Uh, and, you know, we did this for QOF quality of service type results around kind of 95th percentile for average case results, for distributional results, for uh, fairness results, uh, for predictability results, uh, sort of latency type predictability results. And so we had kind of chapters and themes, and, but all of them were looking at uh, analyzing the same sort of new axiomatic classes of policies. Uh, what is an axiomatic class? What does that mean here? So here it's, it's, it's inspired by sort of the economic way of, you know, if you think of axiomatic notions of what a voting rule should uh -huh. be like, the same third sort of things, but with scheduling policy. So for example, what can you write down a set of axioms for what it would mean for a prior a policy to prioritize small jobs uh, over large jobs and, you know, have that be in a strong enough sense that it's near optimal. Uh, cause SRPT is one policy that prioritizes small jobs over large jobs, but that's a very specific one that requires you to know exactly the remaining time and the original size of jobs and requires you to be able to switch whenever you want between jobs without paying any cost or having any lag. Uh, and so how broadly can you define a set of policies that, uh, is like that in spirit and has performance that is still near optimal and not much worse, uh, but includes uh, as many much variety of uh, variations as possible. And so, the, you know, some sort of notion of approximately always uh, prioritizing small jobs. So you don't want it to be too strict uh, that it can't include things that you know are hacky versions of it, but you want it to be uh, in that spirit. So uh, it tended to be trying to write down very simple axioms, two or three for each class that prioritize, you know, a fair policy or a small job first policy or a large job first policy uh, and, and then see what you can prove about them. Would you say that the research was responsive, as you mentioned earlier, this need to problematize the theory so that it more accurately um, conveyed the complexity of real real world situations? Yeah, so I mean, what I what I I think part of what it was driven by was the idea that you know there's one version of applying this sort of scheduling theory to practice, which is SRPT is good. So you go off and in your policy, wherever possible, try to prioritize small jobs. Uh, but at the end of the day, then whatever policy you have, there's no rigorous bounds that I can give you on the performance. There's no prediction I can give you about the distribution of the performance you're going to have or anything. So it's like you get inspiration from the theory uh, as opposed to actually the theory being actionable in the system design and operation. And the hope was that uh, if you have classes of policies, then the policy you implement is still one of these classes, even though you've done uh, you know crazy things to make it work in your system. Uh, and so now I can still give you a way of giving you know a QoS bound. I can still give you uh, you know confidence intervals on the performance you should expect, so that you can identify when something's going wrong by if it's outside of that confidence interval. I can still give you all of those tools that you can use in real time for your system, as opposed to uh, just leaving you be once I give you the inspiration to prioritize small jobs. Adam, in our previous conversation, we had a great sort of overview of how special Caltech undergraduates are just when you look at the numbers and their interest in the fundamental research, yeah. even when there are these massively, you know, <laughs> high paying jobs that are dangled yeah. in front of them. Would you say that you were similar? Did you have that kind of approach? I did. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I came out during the dot, I, I graduated from undergrad during the dot com, uh, you know, bubble, the, that era. And, you know, there were not many people from Carnegie Mellon going to graduate school at that point. Uh, it was a, you know, I forget the exact numbers, but something like, you know, five or 10% of the class at most uh, was going to grad school. Everybody was uh, going to industry and, you know, similar to uh, the world today where there were lots of available high paying jobs in industry that were attracting people. And how uh, centralized was Silicon Valley at that point? In other words, if you're graduating with a PhD from Carnegie Mellon and CS, is everybody headed to Northern California or it's more dispersed than that? 
It was maybe even more centralized than it is now uh -huh. um, because, you know, now there's a bunch of different places where you can go for industry things that at that point, a lot of the startups that were really exciting were all just in Silicon Valley. And so there was a, a huge, you know, channel going from Carnegie Mellon to the Bay Area. And was there active recruiting on campus? Did you have to yes. fend off interest in that kind of thing? <laughs> yes, there were there were plenty of opportunities in that front, but I I was I, I just wasn't interested in that at that point. I, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to grad school and be uh, a professor. <sighs> and even by the time you were thinking about finishing up the PhD, were you considering industry at that point? No, it was very I, much the I, same track? I was very, you know, from, you know, junior year or so in undergrad, I knew that I wanted to be a professor and the hope was that I could pull it off. Uh, I knew I, maybe maybe more than most. I knew that that was not a given. It was not a given to go to grad school and, you know, uh, come out the other side with a professorship. But I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I kind of knew that I, I, I really liked teaching and mentoring, you know, even as an undergraduate and TAing and participating in that sort of thing. And I, I wanted to be in an environment where I could do that. So I, I kind of had in my head that, you know, even if I was not at a place like Caltech or MIT, I wanted to be there rather than in industry. Um, As you mentioned, because the thesis was book-like in its intellectual cohesiveness, what was the overarching argument? What was the contribution you were making, would you say? So the argument was really that uh, it's possible to have scheduling uh, policies and analysis of scheduling policies that was relevant and you know actionable in operation of modern systems. Uh, and that you could do so not by analyzing a detailed specific model for a specific system, but by analyzing these axiomatic classes that would apply to every system all at once, uh, as opposed to, you know, going one by one towards, you know, Google is doing their system this way. Let's analyze the precise details of this system. Uh, but instead, let's just say axiomatically, we want policies that work like this. Uh, this class will let us analyze Google systems, Facebook systems, Microsoft systems all at once. Where have you seen applications of this idea? Where has it gone off and achieved a life of its own? Uh, so uh, actually, I mean, and on the academic side and the industry side, I think uh, it, it did very well. So the uh, industry, it's a pretty common practice now to be willing to do size-based scheduling. So. You don't have to make an argument uh, that this is the right thing to do. There's a most system designs have prioritization of small jobs in some way to avoid having them sit behind large jobs, and and there's a recognition that that's what you have to do when you have heavy heavy tail job sizes, and that just wasn't the case before. Uh, you know, we had that work. Um, the the other the idea of classes. It, it's fun actually. I was just a week ago sitting on a dissertation for one of Moore's uh recent students and he sort of uh redid my thesis but better in some sense uh <laughs> after 15 years um so he he has a really beautiful class that's even broader than the ones that i was able to do where you can prove just really deep results uh and so like the idea of scheduling studying scheduling classifications instead of studying scheduling policies has lasted at least 15 years and uh, people are still coming up with creative new ways to do that. Um, I'm sure you're not being fair to yourself. It's probably more <laughs> accurate to say that it's better as a result of some of the things that you were doing 15 years <laughs> it was, ago. No, it was great. Yeah, I mean, it's the next in the stepping stone, right? But it, it's it's a yeah, it's a really beautiful, uh, beautiful work that he did building on and the stuff that I did. And it, it's fun, the early heat. He's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of parallels between this, um, each, each of his results and things that he extends and generalizes from what I had done at the, the time 15 years ago. So it was, it, was, it was really fun sitting on the committee and seeing him present it. Adam, I know that, that sustainability and resilience, that, that comes online for you later on when you're at Caltech. Right. But I wonder at a more elemental level if some of the things that you were thinking about in graduate school just apply in these realms because it's efficiency at the end of the day. Yeah. So, I mean, at the, at the time, energy wasn't something that I was thinking of as a motivator. My, my last year in the PhD, as I was starting to think about what's next, it cropped up a little bit. Uh, but, you know, yes, efficiency helps. So, right, if you're, if you're uh, able to finish jobs quicker, then your server can sleep more and you're more efficient. Uh, so uh, there's certainly a tie in terms of 
making these data centers more efficient is uh, an important thing. But at the time, it was really uh, more about just getting performance better. You know, it was, you know, the, the motivation was, uh, you know, web servers, video streaming, all of these things, latency and lag was still very noticeable and very uh, frustrating uh, for users and, and the system operators. And so there was a big push to just get rid of that. Uh, Tell me about circa 2006, 2007. Were data centers, were industries that were involved in this, were they already expressing concern about energy consumption? Was that already happening? The data centers, not so much. The uh, observers of data centers, yes. So there were, there were lots of studies coming out in that time, uh, starting to point out for the first time how much uh energy usage uh data centers were having you know it was crossing the one or two percent mark of the total electricity usage so people were starting to take notice and there were a couple big you know government sponsored uh sur projection surveys that were just being started and being talked about in the 2006 and then coming out in 2007 uh and those that's where it really start to started to catch people's attention uh and it wasn't it was definitely not an industry driven recognition it was uh governments or, uh, you know, Greenpeace uh, style recognition that was happening uh, rather than from an internal out, external in. Uh, I'll test your memory. Besides more, who else was on your thesis committee? Uh, so Alan Schellerwolf was a, uh, a collaborator very frequently during the, my PhD. And so he's, he was a business school faculty. And, uh, you know, for myself, I, I was not sure when I was graduating, whether I wanted to go to an OR department or a business school or a CS department, and I applied to all of them. And, you know, I would have been happy in any of them. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, I was, uh, I was trying to decide between going to a business school and going to coming here to Caltech. Uh, and uh, it was, it, it was not an, not an obvious choice for me at the time. Um, and so Alan was, was a good piece of advice for that side of life, the OR and business school side of life. Um, but so Alan was there, uh, John Lafferty, who is a statistician, uh, and then I think Anupam uh, Gupta was my fourth one, but I don't know. I don't remember for sure. I might have to look at my CV for that. Uh, you might have it up so you can tell me if I'm right, if I'm missing, <laughs> am I wrong? <laughs> uh, Mags, Scheller Wolf, and Ward Witt. Oh, Bruce Mags. Uh, oh, and Ward Witt. I'm forgetting Ward. Ward uh, was great. So I didn't have Anupam. Uh, so uh, yeah, Bruce Maggs was uh, a very inspirational person. So he's a uh, he was one of the founders of Akamai, which is a uh, you know big content distribution network. And so he was you know a really great example of he's a theoretician and algorithms person, but you know started a company based on uh, routing algorithms that change the world in terms of networking. Uh, and so he was a big inspiration for that. And then Ward Witt is sort of one of the godfathers of uh, scheduling and queuing theory, one of the kind of most published, most cited people in that area from Columbia, uh, who I got to know because Moore did a sabbatical at Columbia, and I spent a lot of time there while she was on sabbatical there. And then before, you know, a year or two before the dot-com bubble, when things were still going really strongly in Silicon Valley, when you were thinking about academic positions, was the academic job market similarly strong? Would you see that parallel and in interest from institutes of higher learning? So it, it was, and then it tanked. So so the while I was in grad school, the academic job market was extremely strong. Uh, and the year that I went out, it disappeared. So I was, in some, uh, you know, I was pretty unlucky in some sense, lucky in get, getting the job that I had. It was perfect in the way it worked out, but uh, unlucky in the sense that the year that I was graduating, uh, academic positions were few and far between and were disappearing. You know, people would post ads and then pull them down because the position would be going away because of the crash uh, that was going on. Oh, wow. And so, uh, so it was a situation where, you know, a few years before people were beginning, you know, dozens of interviews everywhere. And then the same type of person, you know, the year I was out would just get a couple because there would just be, you know, 5X, 10X, fewer positions available. How much um, of that was just about the general crash of 2008 and which was specifically tech-based? 
Yeah, it was it was just that crash, uh, and it was the same thing that happened a few years ago with the housing crash, where uh, you know when endowments tank, uh, hiring positions uh, disappear uh, because the schools don't have the money for the startups, and so uh, that just happened to be the case the year that I was graduating and the year after for the academic market. Um, Adam, I've heard it direct from Jean Luc Chameau about his approach to navigating during the crisis, which was. We're hiring. We are staying yeah. strong. We're going to dip into our endowment. Did yeah. you sense, you know, to the extent that you were interviewing other places, that Caltech's response to the crash was unique? Um, well, the places that we're interviewing were the places that were doing that. Yeah. So, sure. <laughs> so you know, the places that still hired either had a need and so could uh, like people were leaving and they just couldn't afford to not hire or they were dipping in. And so it wasn't you know, distinctive compared to the place that I was interviewing, but it was definitely distinctive because they were interviewing. Um, and, you know, I think that that was important, right? I, and so, like, it was clear, you know, when I was interviewing here that the market was crashing, but they were still wanting to grow. Yeah. Uh, they weren't going to let the market crashing impact their plaque, the fact that they were going to grow. Um, During so, graduate I, school, did you have a sense of CS at Caltech, did that loom large in your mind at all? What was happening here? No, I didn't know Caltech when I was in graduate school. So I, I, that's not completely true. I knew Caltech because a couple of my peers had been undergrads at Caltech and they were brilliant. So uh, I had this idea that brilliant people come from Caltech. Like, you know, everybody I had ever met from Caltech was just, you know, a brilliant uh, uh, person at Carnegie Mellon. Um, but I didn't know the faculty in the department. I didn't know, it was it was just one of those schools that was on my list to apply to because uh, Moore said it was good. And so I should apply there. Uh, I didn't know the details of the department at all. And so I, it was a lot of homework before I came out. And, and Caltech was my first interview. So it was uh, a lot of, you know, homework. And uh, I, was, I must say I was a bit intimidated because two of the people here were really uh, sort of big names in my, uh, that I hadn't known personally, but was aware of. A big names who had been in the area that I was in and then moved to other areas. So I, I wasn't kind of, you know, I wasn't seeing them at conferences, but I knew about all their papers kind of thing. Uh, this amazing contrast that you drew earlier about how CS at, at Carnegie Mellon is bigger than Caltech in its entirety. What did you see as some of the opportunities and challenges in that stark of a divide? In other words, Caltech is small as a whole, but you know, if you look at geology or physics, it's really not that much smaller than right. peer programs. But clearly for it's CS, this was an idea. enormous distinction. Yeah. What 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 was going through your mind as you were making those decisions? So I, I actually, it, it was a plus for me. It was one that I didn't understand, but it was exciting. So I, I didn't really know in retrospect what I was walking into, walking into a small department, be as small as it was. Uh, but I liked the idea of being in a place where you had intellectual room. Uh, and I think, you know, one, one thing that the interview made clear and that, you know, all my return visits made clear was that there was just not going to be pressure to be a traditional networking person or a traditional algorithms person or a traditional whatever here. Meaning you just really, couldn't be siloed. It's just too small. I couldn't be siloed. And, and this, you know, the other, the big departments, especially in CS where I was uh, looking, you know, it was the, the advice that, you know, you were hearing about tenure was, you know, make yourself known in your area, whatever that is, and then, you know, do that thing because that's how you're going to be evaluated for tenure. And, you know, that's how you're going to recruit students. And, and that was the approach that all the junior faculty at those schools were doing. Um, and I didn't like that, you know, as I mentioned, I was, you know, I, I liked being in OR. I liked doing stuff that overlaps with business. I like doing stuff that overlaps with applied math. I like, you know, not being uh, constrained in how I think about problems and where I publish my work and who I work with in that way. And it, I got the sense rightfully so that, you know, at Caltech, it would give me that flexibility. So while I was going to be in a CS department at the time, uh, it was not a uh, traditional CS department by any means. And I could really be free to kind of run any sort of research style and research agenda that I wanted under that umbrella. And no one would look, uh, no, no one would care. No, it would just cheer me on kind of thing. The um, general theme that we talked about in our previous conversation about Caltech's insistence on supporting junior faculty 
Was that something that was apparent to you even in the, the job talk process part, even before you joined the faculty? Um, it was apparent to me, I think, in the second visit. The, the first visit uh, for CS uh, interviews is, is really focused on explaining what you do. Mm -hmm. and so the first visit, uh, you know, I gave my job talk. Uh, at, what was clear to me from the first visit was everybody wanted to know details. Uh, you know, at, at many schools, you'll show up and, you know, especially people who are outside of your area, you'll shoot the breeze, you'll talk very informally about stuff. Uh, you know, here... This was uh, technical. You were technical. This was explaining. technical. I, I got up, you know, I, I, I still remember my first meeting because I, you know, I got up in the morning super early in Pittsburgh and it was, you know, a blizzard had happened the night before and I spent half an hour scraping off my car window, getting the ice off and then driving to the airport. And then I show up around lunchtime uh, on campus to 90 degree weather in January and sunny and I go <laughs> check in at the app and I check into the Einstein suite and I, you know, I walk up and I just see all this Einstein memorabilia and get very intimidated like what is this place <laughs> you know really this is the world i'm walking in and i go down to the app and i you know meet Stephen Lowe for lunch uh and you know he says hi and then the next words out of his math, mouth are i'm gonna miss your talk uh so here's some paper can you show me your main theorem and how to prove it uh <laughs> and i was like okay <laughs> And, you know, that was it. Like, you know, basically it was technical the rest of the day. Uh, and, you know, that was just a very different experience than any other place that I went in the level that everybody wanted to understand exactly what I had done and how I had done it. And uh, and it was exciting and fun to, to talk about the research in that way. And this had a positive impact on you. It yeah, spoke well it of the culture a, here. Yeah. Like, you know, everybody... First of all, everybody cared about what I did and wanted to understand it, uh, you know, because if you don't care, you just ask superficial things. You, you know, tell people about the university and you let them go. And so everybody really cared to understand what I was doing and everybody was trying to find connections to the tools they were using and asking me interesting questions about the math that I had been using. And so it was really it was really a positive experience, whether as a selling point or just because that's how you saw it yourself. Did you emphasize the relevance to industry of this work or was that not something to to talk about at that first meeting yeah so i mean i i talked uh, a lot about theory and practice in my uh job talk and in my meeting so it was a lot of not industry specifically although i mentioned industry taking it up but it was a lot of like of the back and forth between working with people who are doing system design system implementation and working on theory and trying to make sure that the theory I prove leads to a new system design, you know, in six months in a year, uh, that being the research vision. So that that was really what I tried to convey in, in my my spiel about myself at the time, which was, you know, that was what I do. That was how I approached research. Did um, you know you'd be coming back for a second visit when you left for the first? I got a really good feeling. I mean, I my, my sense was that I had uh, and, you know, done a good job and that they liked the style of research that I was doing. And so, uh, you know, it, the Caltech offer process takes a long time, but I was getting very positive signals, uh, very quickly after my visit. Uh, so I, I sort of expected that, which was, you know, good because it was my first interview. So, uh, it was, it was nice to walk into the other ones feeling like the, uh, this first one went very well as, uh, now, was it only CS departments that you were considering, given the nature of the job market at that point, given the relevance of what you were doing? Were there other places where you could have been a faculty member? Yeah, so I, I applied to EE, OR, business school, and CS departments, uh, and I had interviews in, in each of those. Um, and, you know, when it when it came down to finally making a decision, I was deciding between a, a business school and, a, and Caltech as my the places where I felt like I had the best fit. So in that road not traveled, what would a business school professorship, <laughs> what did that what would that have looked like for you? Yeah, so it's it's very interesting. There's trade offs uh, in both directions. I'm very I'm very happy that I made the choice I made. Um, uh, I think it's been the right thing for me, my style, and I, you know, I think I, I made it for good reason and it was the right decision. Uh, but a, a business school model is a little different. So, so in, in business schools, you you don't have students supported by your grants in the same way that you do in engineering departments. Uh, like CS. So the, the students are supported by the teaching they do for MBAs. 
And so students are basically to a large extent fully supported by the department. And you as a faculty then can cut off all of the grant writing part if you want. You can still, of course, write grants to do things if you want them. But you know, you, it's a much, 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 much smaller part of your time commitment. Uh, and then because the students are kind of free form in that way, they have their own funding, uh, there's a lot looser match often between students and faculty. So the students work with faculty, but they don't necessarily have a, you know, uh, one to one type relationship, which is often the case. And that's something that I liked. I mean, even the way I run my group now, I co advise a lot of students with a lot of other faculty. I like that my students work with more than one person. And it's not that my lab is isolated in a little silo from everything else. And business schools have that culture, like the students have their own funding. So you're not tied to someone because they're paying you out of their grant. You can work on lots of projects. You can work with somebody for a few years and then decide that now you want to work with someone else kind of thing. Uh, but then also because of that, groups are much smaller because students have to be supported by the department. So the department decides how many students there are. You don't really decide how many students there are in your group kind of thing. Um, and then teaching wise, you teach MBA classes, uh, which is a different thing than teaching undergrads. Oh, yeah. uh, um, and so uh, and then let's see what else uh, you industry collaboration is fairly similar. Um, publication process is a lot different. So you publish in journals primarily rather than conferences like the CS model. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're, you have kind of longer papers that are, you know, maybe deeper in, on the individual paper level, but, uh, you know, fewer and far between uh, compared to the CS uh, publication slam. Uh, so on the second visit, was that more of the interpersonal focus to see if you'd be a right fit for the department, yeah. especially given how small it is? That's right. So the second visit, the goal is to understand you know, the culture of the department, how junior faculty were treated, uh, what it would be like to live in Pasadena since I had never lived on the West Coast. Um, my wife came along at the time uh, uh, for that one. And so to see, you know, what she could do and to look at job, job choices for her as well. Um, yeah, and but a big the big thing was like, this is a small department. Would I really have, you know, enough collaboration here? Is is the, do the benefits of being in a small place in terms of space outweigh the fact that you wouldn't have, uh, you know, people in your as many people in your area around to bounce ideas off? Could you know, would there be enough to to make that happen? Kind of thing. What were some of the takeaways that you got in terms of in that second visit learning about the culture of CS at Caltech? Yeah, I mean, so for me, Manny and Stephen, who I, I think I mentioned in the last one around mentors for me, like uh, they were the big thing. So Manny and Stephen, you know, were really, uh, you know, it was clear that they would be good collaborators for me in terms of having space around me, but also being there to co advise and give advice and help me along the way. And so that was, I think, the biggest thing in terms of getting me over the fear of going to a much smaller place, uh, that there would be, it wouldn't be just me on an island, there would be this, uh, you know, a few people close enough uh, that I would have that community and among the faculty. And then also just talking to other junior faculty about the experience and hearing, you know, how uh, protected junior faculty are and supported they are from, uh, you know, funding and administrative load and these sorts of things. What kind of takeaway did you get on the on the topic of collaboration where it's a small department, what you might need to do beyond Caltech? Was that encouraged? Was that expected? Was that just sort of a natural outgrowth to simply how small the department was? Yeah, I think it, it, the pattern that I saw was basically most people had a couple people locally and then had a collaboration network that was broad. Uh, and locally you know, meaning UCLA, locally USC. At yeah, you know, no, locally at Caltech and then a collaboration network with, you know, collaborators broadly across other universities in the US or beyond. And that was that was good enough for me. Like, so I wasn't I wasn't worried about that. I just wanted to make sure there would be some local some enough local. Yeah. And then I, I felt like I had plenty of collaborators that I could work with uh, everywhere else uh, if I, you know, as I as needed, as desired, and that that wouldn't be a problem. Given how so, important in, in, in your decision making Stephen and Manny was, what were they each working on at that point? So Stephen at that point was doing networking. Uh, he was finishing up with his fast TCP work. Um, and he had just come back from his venture at that point. Was that the timing? I think he was just, I think he was still partial. Uh-huh. Uh, 
um, for the first year. Like I think it was still partially gone, partially there. But he was it was clear that he was coming back and he was you know ramping back up his research and his research group, which was important for me. Uh, and then Manny was working on uh, you know just generally distributed systems uh, and uh, the this was just before he was. Uh, starting to do the earthquake monitoring, uh, the seismic community network work. So it was a lot about how do you manage, you know, peer-to-peer -peer data oriented distributed systems. I wonder between both of them, you got the immediate sense of just how broadly conceived the research agenda can exactly, be. Exactly, right? It was, it was very different than talking to the networking researchers at CMU who, yeah. you know, it, you know, for them at CMU it was often like, Okay, in video streaming, there is this bottleneck, and we're going to fix that bottleneck. And you know, for Stephen and many, it was really societal. Like, here's a big societal problem. This is how my style of distributed systems work can uh, make a difference, and that was that was exciting. Was Stephen starting to think about sustainability and EVs and that kind of stuff at that point? Not EVs, but uh, he also, like me, was bridging into uh, sustainability through the uh, networks world. Uh -huh. So he was starting to think about like how to make the internet more sustainable. Is the, are there contrast congestion control algorithms or what changes you can make to routers to make you know the the lines go on and off and manage that that sort of thing in a dynamic way? So he you know was a like mind in that sense of like that basically viewing that as a promising direction, but not having done a ton there. Uh, Adam, this this question that we pursued previously about you know the narrative of undergraduates voting with their feet, you know from physics. Yeah. To where we are now with CS. When you joined the faculty, where 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 was that transition at that point? And not begun yet. Wow, um, really? Um, so I mean, when I joined, there were I'm going to get the number a little bit off, but on the order of ten undergrad CS majors. Uh -huh. Wow. See, I would have thought. I mean, given. I mean, just I mean, where it, tech was, you would think that it would be bigger than that. What's what? What's the takeaway? What do you what do you make of that? I mean, there was not an undergraduate major in CS until was it two thousand and three at Caltech, uh, and so I was arriving, you know, like two thousand seven. So it had only been like four years. Uh, so I think you know there had been some people moving into it, uh, but it just wasn't a major yet right uh there wasn't you know if you were applying to universities and you looked at caltech you saw just a few cs people so if you were interested in cs you went to other places and uh or you prioritized other places i think um and so it was really i think pretty much every year for the first few years it was doubling in terms of the uh you know or going up by 50 percent or something at least uh so it was it was major growth the entire time i've been here but at the uh, point where you made the decision to join the there faculty was, there was no indication that that trend line was going to come no i mean uh but but i wasn't really when you're when you're starting as an or at least for me when i was starting as an assistant professor i wasn't really thinking that much about undergrad life uh you're thinking, you know, when you're when you're talking about schools, you're looking at the research environment, you're looking at the graduate program, uh, and you know the undergraduates, uh, you know, yeah, it just wasn't as it wasn't I wasn't deciding which school to go to based on the undergrad program, uh, I guess. And the happy decision for you, you never got far along enough in other options where you thought maybe the job market is such that I'll have to consider industry. It was. That worked no, out. The timing worked out. Yeah, for it worked out. I, you know, I, I had interviews. Maybe I, I probably was a little bit uh, naively confident uh, that, you know, given my the interviews I had, I would make something work. But I also kind of figured that if it didn't work, I would just get a postdoc and, you know, try again the next year, kind of thing. Was Stevens' um, venture was that appealing to you just to know that at that point in Caltech's history, it was no longer so ivory tower where. <laughs> Yeah. That was something that you could do if you wanted. Yeah, no, it was definitely nice to know that uh, a faculty member was doing that and it was viewed as a plus by his colleagues, yeah. not as a negative. Uh, yeah. All right, so set the stage for me. You join the faculty and it's always that mix of what do you extrapolate from your graduate research? Yeah. Where do you slot in in terms of what's happening right now? And then the unique Caltech question is, how do you maximize this nurturing environment where 
you're built and you're supported for success on the way to tenure. That's right. And so I, you know, I, I, I started right away. So I was, uh, I showed up very, uh, unsure of myself in terms of what I needed to do when. And, uh, I think I, I still remember the sort of, this, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, a statement of Caltech's administrative some, uh, sometimes. So I, I showed up and I walked to my office door the first day and it didn't have my name on it. It had uh, the name of a previous professor who had been denied tenure uh, in the spring. <laughs> oh, no. And so there was this like moment of, okay, <laughs> who is this guy? Oh. <laughs> maybe it was uh, intentional. Maybe it wasn't leaving it I up. I don't think it was intentional, <laughs> but it was one of these oversights that was like, okay, this is uh, not, the, not the warm and fuzzy feeling that I was hoping for when I walked into my office office the first day um and then you know the thing that struck me like you know you're always uh always a little nervous your first day but it was you know i was showing up in august and so you know at carnegie mellon uh classes had started already and so the place was buzzing and it's giant and of course in caltech classes don't start until the end of september uh and most faculty are like gone in august and so i showed up and there was very few people around very few students so it was a huge contrast in scale and activity uh, that was uh, a little nerve wracking at first uh, when I showed up uh, because, you know, I, since I didn't do a postdoc, I was showing up not having graduate students, not having postdocs. And so it was just me in an office, right? Uh, and so, you know, I, I hung around with Stephen and Manny and went to their group meetings and met some of their students. Uh, but it was, you know, another month and a half or so before the department kind of felt busy uh, uh, after I arrived. And, and that was, uh, you know, coming from a giant place. It was uh, one of these, OK, this is this is small. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I did want to ask, you mentioned not be, not doing a postdoc. Was that common at that point to leapfrog the postdoc or were, were you a unique case? Um, it was it's not like. A uh, huge, huge minor. I'd say, you know, 60, 60, 70 percent of people were doing postdocs. So there were there were in fact, some people that weren't. Uh, in my case, my my wife and I wanted to move once. And, you know, she was uh, graduating with her master's from Carnegie Mellon that year. And, you know, if I had gone to do a postdoc for something, she would have had to have a you know a gap year without or a sort of a strange movement. And so we decided we'd just come. And that way she would be able to, you know, get started on her career mm -hmm. uh, right away without that gap. Um, and so, you know, I, I always, I always advise my students to do that postdoc year because it's really, you know, it's, it's a much different feeling when you show up already having your students and postdocs that first year, cause you can just hit the ground running the first year without them. You're, you're kind of, you're carrying the load a little bit. Uh, and so you have to kind of really find, uh, people to work with in the environment rather than having your team come in with you on day one. And so, uh, the first year for me was a lot of. Uh, collaboration. And because I didn't have my own students or my own postdocs, it was a lot of continuing projects that I had worked on on my own or that I was working on with collaborators outside of Caltech while I got to know people in Steven's group, while I got to know people in Manny's group and, and so on. Uh, and then, you know, the thing I still, you know, I still have a strong affinity for postdocs because of uh, the model at Cal the model at Caltech really helped me in that first year where uh, we have these free floating postdocs that come in and you know they they have a they have a mentor, uh, but at the same time they are get a lot of departmental or uh, funding from centers or whatever it is, uh, and so they have the ability to work with anybody they want in the department. And so there were two postdocs that first year that I really bonded with. Uh, you know, basically we were the same age, right? They had just graduated. Uh, and so we collaborated, we hung out, you know, uh, and we, you know, it really helped in terms of getting the research off the ground to have people like that around that were free floating, that were also looking for that kind of kick off in a new direction during yeah. their post, just like I was as starting as a faculty member. Adam, um, on that point, starting up your own research agenda, how much of your thesis did you want to leave on the proverbial shelf? Even if there was more to do, you self-consciously wanted to go in new projects? And what did you want to continue on? Because obviously there are unanswered questions. There's still the work to do. Yeah, I, I was looking to make a hard right. Uh -huh. um, so I definitely, you know, I was, I was very conscious of, you know, there's papers I can write 
quickly that will be important to write uh, and that will you know take a year year and a half to write those and get them out mm -hmm. and you know I'll, I'll screw through them so i had a plan for it was i think it was three or four papers that were like thesis driven that i would uh finish up and get out the door and get published and my view was that that was my off ramp and that let me still publish at a consistent rate as I was ramping up new things in other directions. And so I was spending most of my intellectual capital on new directions, but enough intellectual capital to kind of go down the off ramp for, for the thesis work. So once that month and a half had elapsed and the department was starting to come to life, what do you recall? What were some of the ideas that were animating the faculty at that point? Yeah, so I, the, I think I mentioned in our last call the uh, word, Manny, I think, introduced me to John Ledger very early on, who was in a economics faculty. And, you know, Manny uh, and Stephen were both very interested in the interaction of economics with networking. Um, and I was too. And so I started to spend a lot of time with the economists at the RAF uh, on Friday evenings and just hear what they were thinking about and the way they thought about problems and talk to them about the way CS people were doing economics and hear them rant about how it was the wrong way for reason X and reason Y yeah. uh, and how we didn't understand the right way to do economics and, you know, bounce ideas back and forth and all this sort of thing. And uh, that was really good. And, and Manny really kind of pushed me to make that introduction to John and, uh, and make those connections, which uh, was really helpful of him. Uh, and so, and then one of the postdocs, uh, that I really worked a lot with Jason Martin, who's now faculty at UC Santa Barbara. I kind of adopted him as my postdoc and uh, we spent a lot of time working together. Uh, he was at the intersection of control theory and economics and I had never learned control theory before. And so I learned control some control theory or started to learn control theory from him. And we both learned economics together and uh, Jason and me and John co-taught a course in economics in the winter on the interaction of CS econ where I taught the like CS view of economics and then John came in and taught the economics view and we went back and forth uh sort of uh each week with uh you know a CS lecture and an econ lecture uh and people like Kim Border and uh Charlie Plott and Manny and Stephen were in the class along with the graduate students and so I was lecturing to them about you know the recent papers coming out in this space and it was a really exciting way to to learn a new area um Adam so if we can reverse engineer where CS is now and just you know the overall appreciation that around the institute it's computational everything right it's yeah. it's embedded all over the campus going back to when you first got your bearings as to how cs was connected or not within caltech more generally so was it was it pretty much a 50 50 two-way street in terms of cs faculty seeking collaborations elsewhere and other faculty coming to cs with specific needs what was your sense of that dynamic so at the beginning, it was definitely outward. Uh -huh. So, you know, when I arrived, it, there was some connection with other departments, but, you know, it was just be the beginning of this. And, and Caltech is not yet a place where there was recognition uh, elsewhere on campus of the needs in CS. So there, was, there were ties, there were examples of connections, uh, but often those were, uh, you know, I guess sometimes those were CS driven. So like the, you know, there are exceptions like the quantum computing part was going strong at that point. And so there, that was a very much a two way street uh, and CS Econ had started. And I think with me and Manny uh, kind of kicking it into gear there, it really grew in activity at that point. Um, and then the Eric Winfrey's molecular programming was another a really strong two way street at that point. Uh, with Richard and John Doyle and uh, Shuki and, and others. Uh, but, you know, the the sort of connections to chemistry and astronomy and physics more broadly than quantum weren't really uh, there yet. And so there was a lot of uh, CS faculty that were kind of getting interested in these areas and uh, trying to make the connections, I think, uh, at that point. And then it, the balance has sort of, you know, yeah. each year shifted more and more in the other direction where uh, at this point, there's just a huge uh, external push for, can you help me with this? Can you teach my students? Blah, you know, X, you know, I have these problems. No, I mean, it seems it's it, 
the way you're describing it, it seems very counterintuitive circa 2022. You would think that it would be the astronomers and the economists and the biologists who had all of these computational needs yeah. to go to CS, but it's very fascinating. What then were the needs that CS faculty had where they were really outwardly driven in their research questions? So it, it was people becoming excited about these plus X areas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're, if you're working in machine learning and you're seeing that the tools can be applied to non-convex problems of particular types, uh, then you're searching for applications and you're reading papers and you're finding that there are people doing this in area X. And then you're going to seek those people out to see if you know they're actually interested in the new algorithms and design. So it was a lot of of that kind of computational outreach. Like I've made this uh, new advance. I think it should be useful for you. Will it actually be useful? As opposed to the other way, where uh, you know I think you know Caltech faculty uh, are used to solving their own problems in other areas. And there wasn't yet the recognition that, you know, there might be these people over in CS that uh, can help solve your problems even better uh, with these uh, learning tools. Um, I mean, learning wasn't, uh, learning was not at, on the pedestal. Uh, it is now at that point. And so, you know, it was three or four years before machine learning was taking over the way, you know, getting towards what it is today. Adam, last question for today, and maybe it'll be a bit of a cliffhanger for oh, our next quick. discussion. We're at the end. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so as you were seeing more senior CS faculty making those inroads into other departments, when you felt like it was right for you to start looking for those kinds of collaborations, what's the origin point where you're making the connections between network systems and sustainability? How did that come together specifically from the vantage point of you realizing all of the benefits that could come from going beyond CS, but staying within Caltech? I mean, it came early on because economics, was, it was just very clear to me early on that if I was working with people like John Ledger and Federico, then I had a huge advantage in making progress and understanding the right to ask questions compared to uh, my CS peers at you know CMU who were doing it on an island without ever talking to economists about what they were doing. Uh, and so you know that first year with Jason and John and Federico, we already kind of jumped in, and by you know by the end of that year, we were writing papers together that were involving economics and control and CS. Uh, and so that happens just almost day one and you know to the point where you know the first students i was recruiting i was talking about collaborations with economists uh as a reason to come to caltech um on the sustainability side it took a little longer so i you know stephen and i, I think worked on an island uh you know ourselves in terms of energy and uh you know networking and distributed systems for a year or two before we started to make broader connections around campus uh, and sustainability. And, you know, Resnick Institute didn't exist yet. Uh, the initial formings were still going to be a few years into the future. And, and at that point, even the initial formings were more focused on the, uh, you know, technologies around solar or battery than on the system uh, development. Uh, and so it took a little bit for that to connect more broadly across campus. Um, but the, the econ connection was there almost immediately. All right. Well, Adam, for next time, we'll, we'll delve further into that econ connection. We'll see what happens next.